Born in 1892 in what's now Wrocław, Poland, Manfred Albrecht Fierhar von Richthofen was the son of a prominent aristocratic family. As an athletic child, young Manfred was close to his brothers, Lothar and Bolko, with whom he enjoyed hunting elk, deer, and birds. At the age of 11, von Richthofen was sent to a military school at Wallstadt, graduating in 1909. He felt destined to serve as a cavalry officer and joined the Olan Cavalry Unit in the Prussian Army. With the advent of World War I in 1914, he served on both fronts, seeing action as a cavalry reconnaissance officer in Russia, France, and Belgium. As the technology of the warfare of the time was beginning to make mounted cavalry maneuvers a thing of the past, cavalry officers oversaw such mundane activities as serving as messengers and operating field telephones. To the adventurous and athletic von Richthofen, this led to disappointment and boredom. When he was ordered to transfer to the supply branch of the army, he instead applied for a transfer to the Imperial German Army Air Service, noting that, I have not gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs, but for another purpose. In May of 1915, he was transferred to the air service and began training as an aerial observer. For five months, he occupied the second seat in the aircraft, manning the tail-facing observer's gun and monitoring enemy troop movements. To the impetuous von Richthofen, this was better than the life of a supply officer. As he wrote after his first flight, I had been told the name of the place to which we were to fly, and I was to direct the pilot. At first we flew straight ahead, then the pilot turned to the right, then the left. I had lost all sense of direction over our own aerodrome. I didn't care a bit where I was, and when the pilot thought it was time to go down, I was disappointed. Already I was counting down the hours to the time that we could start again. In September of 1915, he shot down his first aircraft, a French Farman, while he was riding on a German Albatross C-1. Because this occurred behind Allied lines, it was unable to be registered as a confirmed kill. In October, he began pilot training, encouraging his brother Lothar to join the Flieger Troop or Army Air Unit in February. Assigned to an Albatross C-3, Manfred was initially a poor pilot, crashing during his first flight at the controls. However, by the end of April, he'd mastered flying enough to shoot down a French Newport over Fort Dumont. In September, he shot down 2nd Lieutenant Lionel Morris and Captain Tom Reese in their FE-2Bs. And to commemorate the occasion, he had a jeweler make him a silver cup engraved with the date and type of aircraft defeated. While the wartime propaganda machines mythologized von Richthofen's aerial dogfights into a sort of modern-day chivalric duel between equally matched knights of the air, the immorality was much more mundane and terrifying to the early flyers. Air warfare was not a solo effort, but involved a collective squadron of pilots working together, covering each other's rear and flanks, while the lead pilot searched for the slowest and most vulnerable aircraft to target. And rather than using aggressive aerobatic maneuvers, Richthofen would often dive from above with the sun behind him and aim his shots for the enemy aircraft's fuel tanks. The resulting fire left the pilots and gunners of the mostly two-seaters to roast to death in their cockpit. Van Richthofen was successful not because of a sense of chivalry or even his skill as a pilot, but more due to a ruthless efficiency. On November 23rd, Richthofen was flying an Albatross D3 when he encountered British ace Major Lau Hawker, who was flying an older Deep H2. And despite fighting back for some time, Hawker eventually was forced to retreat and shot in the back of the head while attempting an escape. Realizing the limitations of the D3, Richthofen spent the next five weeks flying Albatross D2s, or the Haberstadt D2. In April of 1917, he switched back to the D3 and, and scored 22 victories by late June. It was this plane, which was painted red, that Richthofen truly earned his reputation in. In July of 1917, he began flying a Fokker DR1 triplane, the plane that he's most often associated with. However, it would be another five months before he used this three-winged plane exclusively. By January, Richthofen Richthofen took command of Yasta 11, a corps of elite German pilots, of whom his brother Lothar was also a member. His squadron was extremely successful under his leadership, and in bloody April of 1917, he shot down another 22 aircraft, four in a single day. By June, he was in charge of a fighter wing uh, that oversaw four squadrons. In addition to his abilities in the air, he was also very capable at handling the ground logistics and managing air units. Now, these air units had to be highly mobile, and they were required to move pilots, mechanics, petrol, supplies, and planes quickly from place to place. Because of their brightly colored planes and utilization of tents, trains, and wagons, this unit became known as the Flying Circus. A month later, Richthofen was grounded due to a serious head wound that he sustained on the 6th of July. And while he was able to get back in the air by the end of the month, the wound continued to cause headaches and nausea while he was flying. And through September and October, he was forced to take leave for more recovery. 
At 1100 on April 21st of 1918, Rick Tobin was flying over Moreland Court Ridge near the Somme River. He was in a low-altitude pursuit of a Sopwith camel piloted by Wilfred Wop Reed. As Rick Tovin was pursuing Reed, Captain Arthur Roy Brown drove steeply on the Baron, firing and pulling out of the dive just before striking the ground. Rick Tovin's plane stalled and dove into the ground where it bounced and skidded to a stop. The Baron had a single 303 bullet that had torn through his heart and lungs, killing him before he'd crashed. A post-mortem examination of his body showed that the bullet had entered just under his right underarm and exited next to his left nipple. As Brown had been firing from a position to the rear and left, it was thought that the bullet came from anti-aircraft fire rather than from the Canadian pilot. Rick Tovin was buried by Allied forces with full military honors in the cemetery of Breton on the 22nd of April. He was reinterred by the French at a military cemetery at Freecourt but then moved by the Van Richthofen family to the Invaliden Friedhof Cemetery in Berlin in 1925. Finally, his remains were moved to the family plot in Wiesbaden in 1975, something I actually remember seeing on the news at the time. And at the time of his death, the Red Baron had 73 confirmed victories, though it is thought that the unconfirmed victories could take this total to over 100. Now, this is Richthofen's War of the Air War 1916 to 1918. And it was published in 1972 by the Avalon Hill Games Company, and its designer was Randall C. Reed. And this was one of the early World War I air war games out there. Um, it's a little bit dated today, but at the time it was seen as pretty snazzy. So let's go through the rules. Now, the map board encompasses the area between the River Somme, between La Hamel and Sali Le Sec, where Brown engaged Richthofen in their famous dogfight. And each hexagon represents 50 meters of real space from hexide to hexide. Since you're in the air, you won't be paying a lot of attention to terrain, but there are a few types of terrain that do come into play. The first is the trench line hexes, and those are the irregular brown lines which represent the opposing trench lines. And allied territory extends from, but not including the northernmost trench line north, to all three map board edges, and the German territory extends southward in the same manner. Now, no man's land consists of the hexes between the two trench lines, as well as the trench lines themselves. Now, the roads are these light brown lines, and in scenarios where roads have to be bombed or photographed, it'll be necessary to refer to the target hex listing on the scenario card to, to ascertain the correct target location of that road. Now, each aircraft has aircraft counters, and these are associated with the aircraft status pad, or the ASP, and these include all the pertinent performance information for the aircraft that you'll be flying, as indicated on the scenario cards. And so what you're going to do is you're going to transfer the following information from the aircraft capabilities chart in the instructions to the status pad. First is speed, and that indicates the maximum and minimum speeds that the aircraft can fly at. And you also place the current speed indicator counter pointing to the speed that the aircraft starts the game at. There's accumulated damage, and this is hit points. Basically, players indicate their total accumulated damage factor. And as damage is taken, these boxes are checked off until the track reaches zero and the aircraft is considered shot down. There's an ammunition supply and players indicate the total ammunition supply for both their front and rear firing guns if they have them. If the word none appears in the columns in the aircraft capabilities chart, that indicates that the aircraft in question is not equipped with guns that fire in that particular direction. And in many cases, many of the aircraft won't have, say, rear firing guns. There's a maximum altitude that indicates how high your aircraft can fly. A maximum climb is ind indicates the maximum climb per turn capability. Likewise, a maximum dive, and that indicates the maximum dive per turn capability. And also a maximum dive speed, which indicates the top speed at which your aircraft can perform a dive. There's also a maximum overdive speed, and we'll talk about overdiving a little bit when we talk about diving. And a maneuver schedule, and this indicates how nimble your aircraft is in maneuvering or making turns. You can also indicate any critical hits and whether the pilot of your aircraft is an ace or not. And finally, on the left side, there's your altitude. During the game, you're required to keep record of the exact altitude at which your aircraft is flying at all times. And you'll notice there's two tracks. The first is in a thousand meter indicator and the second is a hundred meter indicator. As you dive and climb your aircraft, you're going to readjust these two counters to reflect these changes in altitude. 
And finally, there's a jammed gun box. And whenever your guns become jammed, you just check this off to avoid confusion. Now, each turn in the game is fairly rapid, and it's based on two segments. In the first segment, player A will make all the adjustments on their aircraft status pad. And then this is followed by a movement phase in which player A moves their aircraft, followed by an attack phase in which player A executes attack by firing their machine guns, and then finally a defensive where player B can return defensive fire on player A if possible. You go into a second segment where everything repeats except this time player B will make the movement and the first attack and then player A will be able to make a defensive attack. Now obviously since you're flying in this game you're going to be moving all the time. And every turn, before a player touches their aircraft counter, they announce their speed and altitude, and these numbers are recorded on the aircraft status pad. And it costs one movement point to move one hex, and the aircraft has to expend its entire speed every turn. Now other actions, such as maneuvering and firing, can also expend movement points. Now when you're announcing your speed at the beginning of a turn, the player can increase or decrease their speed by up to two movement points. However, their speed can never be greater than the aircraft's maximum speed or less than the aircraft's minimum speed. And the front of the aircraft counter always has to face a hex side, and that hex side indicates the direction that the airplane is flying in. And during their first movement in a turn, aircraft must enter the hex directly in front of them. After that, they're free to turn in place or move forward. And a player can make as many turn maneuvers or combination of turn maneuvers and straight flight as they wish, as long as they have the sufficient number of movement points to expend in doing so. Now, individual turns can only be made in a single direction, and each aircraft has a maneuver schedule that indicates the movement point cost to turn a certain number of hexides. Now, note that these movement points are additive and not cumulative. So, for instance, if this aircraft has a maneuver schedule of E, it would cost one movement point to turn one hex to the left, and one plus two or three movement points to turn two hexides to the left, and one plus two plus three or six movement points to turn 180 degrees to the left. If you were turning right, the turn to the first hex side wouldn't cost anything, as it's a zero. The second would cost zero plus one or one movement point, and a 180 degree turn to the right would cost zero plus one plus two or three movement points. Now, if players are free to move their aircraft counter through other aircraft, friendly or enemy, at the same altitude level, but they can't remain there at the end of the movement phase. However, two aircraft can occupy the same hex if they're at different altitude levels. And if an aircraft is in position where they will move off the map board in the next move, you resolve the problem by allowing the offending aircraft to turn in place without moving forward one hex in order to face a direction where they can continue normal movement. And you penalize this offending aircraft one movement point plus the movement point cost of executing the turn maneuver. In addition to moving forward, you can also climb and dive. And as I mentioned before, the aircraft's current altitude is kept track of on the altitude section of the status pad. And before any movement on the turn, the player has to adjust their altitude by climbing or diving, and these altitude changes are made in 50 meter increments. Now, aircraft can never climb a greater distance than that indicated by the maximum climb box on the status pad, and when climbing, the player subtracts one movement point from the aircraft's movement allowance for climbs up to 100 meters, two movement points for climbs of 150 to 200 meters, and three movement points for 250 to 300 meter climbs. And this movement change is made in the first hex of the movement, and the aircraft is then able to move forward with the remaining movement points. And at the end of the movement, you set the aircraft speed back to where it was at the beginning of the move. Now, an aircraft is further limited in climbing to the extent that points subtracted for climbing can never reduce an aircraft's available movement points below its minimum speed. For example, say a Fokker DR-1 with a minimum speed of 3 is traveling at a speed of 5, it couldn't climb 300 meters because it would then have only two movement points available for forward movement. Now, aircraft cannot dive in the same movement phase as they climb. They can only do one or the other, and aircraft can never climb higher than their maximum altitude, nor lower than the 50 meter altitude, and if they exceed these limits, they're simply eliminated from play. Now, diving works a lot like climbing, as it involves 50 meter increments, and each aircraft has a maximum dive that it can accomplish in a turn. And like climbing, dives have to be stated before the player moves their aircraft. Now, before beginning a dive, the player has to set the aircraft's speed to the maximum dive speed, or lower. And there's no penalty in this case for doing this if the aircraft speed was more than two movement points higher on the speed track. So if, it, if the speed of an aircraft was 8 and the maximum dive speed was 5, the player would simply reduce the speed 3 points without any penalty. 
However, only 100 meters of a dive can be executed in one hex. So a dive of 200 meters, for example, would have to be executed in two adjacent hexes, not necessarily the first hexes of movement. And these hexes are called dive hexes. Now dives add movement points to an aircraft's turn, and it's one movement point of, for dives of 50 to 100 meters, two movement points for dives of 150 to 200 meters, three for dives of 250 to 300 meters, four for dives of 350 to 400 meters, five for dives of 450 to 500 meters, and six for dives of 550 to 600 meters. Now aircraft can use maneuvers in the same hex to count as dive hexes, and once the dive is finished, the aircraft speed is switched back to the speed that the aircraft began the dive in. Also, aircraft may dive a distance greater than the vertical distance of their dive capabilities. However, this counts as an overdive, and the plane runs the risk of catastrophically failing if it does so. So to do so, an aircraft sets its speed to the maximum dive speed and begins the dive, and they can overshoot their normal dive by up to 200 meters, and when they do so, they roll 1d6, and on a 1 to 2, they survive the dive, and on a 3 to 6, their plane disintegrates. Combat's pretty basic in this game. To fire on an enemy plane, the target plane has to be in both the range and the field of fire of the firing aircraft's machine guns. Now an aircraft's basic range is 7, and where there's up to a 50 meter difference in the target and the firing plane, this would extend this whole full 7 hexes. Now if the altitude difference between the aircraft is 100 to 150, one range is added to the firing range on the CRT. For 200 meters, two is added, and for 250 meters, three is added. Now aircraft that are at greater than a 250 meter altitude difference can't fire upon each other. Now for the front firing guns, the field of fire is a single row of hexes that the aircraft faces. And for the rear firing guns, this includes all the hexes out of the rear three hexes of the aircraft, except for that hex directly behind the plane, which is blocked by the tail. Also, a rear firing gun's field of fire does not extend below that particular aircraft's altitude level in the row of hexes directly to the rear of the aircraft. In other words, your tail's in the way. Also, aircraft can't fire at another aircraft that's in the same hex that they are, irregardless of their altitude. Now, if an aircraft does end up firing on another aircraft in both the attack and defense phase of the same turn, there's a chance that their guns might jam. To determine if this occurs, you roll a d6, and on a 6, the guns jam. You then mark the jammed box and note that none of these guns can be fired for the remainder of the game. To resolve fire, first you mark one of the ammunition points off on your ammunition track. And if it reaches zero, then the, that machine gun can no longer fire. You then locate the column of the aircraft type in one of the four right-hand columns of the target damage table. Now note that all rear-firing machine guns for all planes are located in column C. You then determine the range to target in hexes and locate that range within the firing aircraft's column. You roll 2d6 and you cross-index the die roll outcome with the range to determine the number of hits on the target aircraft. And when the target damage table calls for hits to be scored, these hits are marked off on the target aircraft's accumulated damage section, starting from the box on the left and moving to the right. Now the defender can return fire during the defensive fire phase if the attacker is within the defender's field of fire, and the defender has ammunition remaining. It's not necessary for the attacker to have actually fired on the defender for the defender to return fire. Now in reality, the fire of both players is simultaneous, so damage to the defender doesn't affect the aircraft until the defensive phase is completed. Now when an aircraft suffers more than 50% damage, that is 50% of its damage boxes have been marked off, rounding off in favor of the aircraft, the aircraft subtracts one movement off its maximum speed and loses 50 meters off its maximum climb capability for every hit it sustains thereafter. Now speed can never be reduced below an aircraft's minimum speed, and if accumulated damage would force an aircraft below minimum speed, then that aircraft must go into an immediate glide, which we'll talk about in a second. There's also a critical hit table, and if the result of combat has an asterisk associated with it, then that aircraft takes a critical hit. Basically, the attacker rolls two dice and checks the critical hit chart to see what the effects would be. And these do take effect immediately. Now, if a player is forced to glide, they will basically try to get off the map board. And now in glides, they can no longer fire their forward firing machine guns. However, they can still use their rear ones. Basically, speed immediately reverts to the aircraft's minimum speed, and they can't gain speed for any reason. 
Also, the aircraft has to lose 100 meters in altitude with no dive bonus for every turn it is in the air. And basically, turning maneuvers are limited to one hex side change for every hex traveled through. And once you're in a glide, accumulated damage can never force an aircraft below its minimum speed. Now, gliding players are either forced to land on the map board or glide off on one of the sides. Now, if they exit from the map board hex in a friendly territory that is behind their respective trenches, they're not considered shot down for victory purposes. However, if they exit from a hex in the enemy territory, which includes no man's land, then they're considered shot down. Finally, players can attain ace status in the game, and to do so, they have to shoot down five enemy aircraft. Now, when attacking, an ace adds one to their die roll on all attacks resolved on the target damage table. And when an ace is flying the target aircraft, one is subtracted from the die roll of the attacker. Now, this doesn't apply to defensive fire in a defensive phase that's directed at the ace. And note that when two aces are involved in an attack with each other, there's no addition or subtractions. Rear gunners are not considered aces in any situation, and when they're firing at a target aircraft in an attack phase, they don't get a dice roll benefit. However, the target aircraft would still get the, the defensive dice roll subtraction if they were piloted by an Hey there, folks. I'm back, and this is Richtofen's War. And today we're going to do Scenario 1, which is the Brown versus Richtofen dogfight. Now, a couple things to mention before I get started. The first is that I forgot to talk about sighting rules. And sighting rules mean that you have to be in sight. You have to have the um, aircraft that you're shooting at in sight for your last tur the last two moves of your turn. So basically, if this guy did, let's just say, let's just turn him here, and he did this. He this is his his last move. Or well, let's go there. One, come on, one, and then. He turned. I guess this would count because that is a move. So that is one, two, and then he could fire. But he couldn't fire like here. He couldn't move in here because that would be his that would be his last move. And then if he go if he went back two moves, it'd be one, and then the last one would be a maneuver. So I think it has to be in the line of sight for that. So I hope that makes sense. I hope I remember it. That's the that's the one thing I remember. The other thing, a little thing about this vassal module. Um with brown and these planes down here, well, with all of the planes, they do not represent in silhouette the actual planes that are being used. Now, the British are going to be using these sop widths, and those aren't sop widths. Um, this is. The problem I was running into is sometimes it's really hard to see. Let's get a really light one here. You can see, if I pop out a little bit, you can see how hard those guys are to see. So I just went, went, went ahead and went with darker planes, but the, their profiles don't necessarily match the actual plane. Um, so if you're the designer of this, you've done a beautiful job with everything. The only thing I might do is change the livery of the planes a little bit to be darker so we can see them against that background. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said, I've got Brown and his crew down here. I've got Richtofen over here. Uh, you'll get victory points for shooting down planes or driving them off. And I think that's about it. Um, let's go ahead and just get started. Um, I've got the Germans set up here. I've got Richtofen here, and then I went, or no, that's not right. This is number three. Here's Richtofen, he's up here. I've got three, three planes on every status pad. And I gave these little X's just as kind of reminders and markers for this. So like for instance, this, I use this like to say, when I hit six points, I need to remember that everything that passed that's gonna cause the plane to lose its performance. So I just use these for general things. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The Germans get to move first. Um, altitude, I think, like I said, I think I'll keep Richtofen at 3,000. I'm going to go ahead and move these guys down to 2,000, 2,800, and 2,800. Now, because I'm doing that, that's actually considered a dive. And in this game, the dive, you have to go back. What you do for dives, so you, make, you go back to your dive speed, which is 5. And then you add one for every 100 meters you have dived. So they get to move seven. That's your final movement. So we're going to go um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this guy goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then Vin Richtofen goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Because, or nine, nine. 
they have a max move of nine. And then you, these guys, once they've moved, they go back to their max speed. Those these ones that have have dived. So everybody back. Yeah. Okay. There is that. Okay. Now brown, I think, will climb. Do the same thing. Oh, I think I want to keep these guys high for now. And so Brown is going to climb up to, he can climb 250. He's going to go to 3,000. I kind of want a, a Brown Richtofen fight here. So let's move Brown first. And these guys get a move of 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six. They can turn seven, eight, nine, ten. Now with the Sop with Camels, they have a... Uh, You'll notice they have a, a maneuver of E, so if they make a right turn, it doesn't cost anything. Okay, then this guy's going to go uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And this guy goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, is, is, is he in range? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, nobody is in range. So we go back to the German move. Now, um, Richtofen is at, he will be able to move in. The thing I'm thinking is, I wonder, yeah, he'll move in. Nine, I keep thinking they're a little bit slower. And then these guys are gonna go ahead and go, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now they're going to do just the. We're going to go ahead and do the forward assault on these guys. So we're going to start with um, Richtofen. Now Richtofen is at a uh, altitude of three thousand, and Brown is at an altitude of three thousand. So they're at the same. They're in the same plane. Um, Richtofen's going to shoot. So we mark off ammunition supply. And since these guys are both aces, uh, there's no die roll modifier fire for being an ace. They, they, they cancel out. But Richtofen gets to go. And there's uh, one, two, three, four. And let's say oh, we go down here to four. This one right here. And we roll 2d6. And we get a seven. So a, a seven at four. Four is going to be a point of damage that uh, Brown takes. So we'll give Brown a point of damage. That's, that's not Brown. There he goes. Where are you at, Brown? Okay. And I marked off the ammunition for Richtofen, and that's it. Everything else is done. Oh, and then Brown gets to shoot back if he wants, which I definitely take. I mean, we've got plenty of ammunition. However, if Brown shoots back again in this turn and he rolls a one because his his guns will jam, so if he decides to do defensive fire, which I think I will, I'm going to go ahead and show that. I've uh, I, inevitably they they roll the one, so um, okay, that's it for them. Now I'll let Brown shoot back. So Brown's shooting back at one, two, three, four hexes, and gets a nine. Ooh. Nine. Um, that's two points on von on von Richtofen. Okay, mark that off. And Brown, there's his ammunition. Okay, so we're good. I think everybody's in that combat's done. Okay, let's go to our second combat. Um, this is number two. One, two, three, four, five. What's the difference in altitude? They're at the same altitude again. Okay, so. Um, let's see. What was I said? Five? So we roll a nine at a nine with a range of five is going to be a one point of damage. So number two marks off an ammo. And number two over here takes a point of damage. Okay, third one. Range is four. 
we get a seven. So four, we go across to seven and we get another one. Okay, so mark off of ammunition and, oh, I forgot to fire back. We'll do that here. Um, that was three, takes a point of damage. Go, oh, where's three? There's three, okay. Um, actually, let's just say that, we'll say number two does not fire back. We'll just let him get by without firing. Maybe he'll avoid getting his guns jammed, but we'll say three does fire back. Did I get... Was this two? two? Yeah, two doesn't fire back, but three does fire back. So three fires back at a range of four. Gets a nine, so four, and then a nine is a two. So um, this guy right here, number three, takes a two points of damage. One, two. Okay, and that's it for the um, the uh, Germans. Let's go ahead and get our moves in. Um. Brown has an interesting situation is I want to get here facing him. So I got to get to here somehow. One, two. Or I could go out in this way. I could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that would do it. Okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to, so Brown's going to start and he's going to move his aircraft back to eight he's going to pull back and let's just do it oh it's going to go five six seven eight and we're going to just say I miscounted, so that's okay. Um, that makes it maybe a little more realistic as far as following that rule where you can't really do the math. That's okay. And we'll, we'll take a shot there. And then this guy's going to go... Um, he's got to go in this one. I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to gang up on the Red Baron here. We can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, he can't be inside. He's got to get here. Um, what we can do, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, and we'll say he has a speed of seven for number two. And then this guy's going to go one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so he doesn't get a fire because he didn't he didn't get this guy sighted. But um, this guy gets to fire and this guy gets to fire. So, um, but the only issue with these guys both firing is that they already fired this turn. So we roll for a d6. If we'll start with Brown at fir first. He gets a six. So he needed. If he got a one or two, he would have been his his guns would have jammed. The other guy gets to fire and he gets a three. So neither of their guns jammed, and they both get to fire. And let's let's go ahead and uh, take our ammunition supplies down one. So we don't remember, forget that. Although I've not really run out of ammunition in this ever. Maybe once in a while, but not very often. Okay, let's start with, uh, we'll start with Brown. 
and brown fires. Let's get a chart here. And brown is firing at one, two, at, at a range of three, and gets a five. Um, that's nothing. So brown doesn't make a hit. The other guy gets to go. Now, he has a minus one because he's firing against the Red Baron. So he rolls a five, and a, he got actually a four at a range of one is a point of damage on the on Richtofen. Richtofen's taken to seven. And that ends the turn. Okay. We go to the German phase, or German turn, and I want to shoot down Brown if I can. I could go one, two, three, four, five. I can do that. I can go. Oh, he's got to climb because Brown's 200 feet ahead of him, above him. So, uh, number two is going to climb. Let's see, I think because Brown is at. No, Brown's at 2,800. Okay, everybody's at the same height. Um, actually, I'm going to shoot. I'm going to go. Yeah, let's stay at 2,800. And number, oh, he can only go down two. That's right. You can only reduce your speed by two. Okay. See, and, and that's the thing. This game shouldn't involve this amount of triangulation to do stuff. You should just be flying, which... Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we can do that. Oops, move back. There we go. Okay, Richtofen. He's going to do this. He's going to go uh, one. That's that's zero. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then this guy is going to go one. That's zero. Two, three, four, five, six, and he can't, he's in the same hex, so he can't fire, so he overshot. Okay, let's go ahead and see what everybody does here. So we're going to start with Richtofen is firing at this guy and it's at a range of two actually I'm gonna go ahead and while I remember these okay number two let's pull our chart up and we get a three so four points at a range of um, two it does one point damage no range of two one point yeah okay so number two, we go to rest, is going to take another point of damage. Okay. And then um, German two is firing at brown. One, two, three, four, five hexes. So five hexes at brown. And they're going to get a minus one because brown's an ace. So they get a seven. So five and seven is a point on brown. And let's move this guy here. Okay, and then we got brown. Yeah. Okay. 
the allies get to go. Um, Brown has a speed of eight. Uh, he can go to ten, which I think I think I'll do that. And I wonder if I can get Richtofen. Somehow I need to get into this hex row here. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nope. Okay. Uh, number two. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go, number two has a move of nine. So I'm going to go one, make a turn, and I can do that. Okay, one, and I'm going to turn to the uh, left. So I'm going to go one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Perfect. Oh, come on. There. This guy's going to do the same kind of maneuver. He's going to go, let's see, that's number three. Three has a 10, so he's going to go. Oh, ah, get back there. One, one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm going to make a turn to the right, S six, seven, eight, not nine, ten. Perfect. Okay. So aircraft two is going to fire, and we'll just go ahead and take him down one on ammunition. And aircraft three is going to fire, so take him down one on ammunition. Okay, let's resolve aircraft two first. And we roll 2d6, and we get a five. Now he's against uh, Richtofen, so it's actually a four. So at a uh, range of one, a four is a point of damage. So Richtofen takes another point, putting him at eight. And then uh, number three against three. Uh, three fires at a range of three. Gets a four at a range of three, four. It's nothing. Okay. Now, oh, then, and then Richtofen gets to fire back. And um, I forgot whether Richtofen fired already this turn. He, I think he did, if I remember right. So there's a chance he's guns will jam. So let's roll that first. And he gets a three. So his guns don't jam. He gets a 7 at 1, where it does 4 points of damage to number 2. Uh, I need to take off his... So number 2 takes 4 points of damage. That's going to be... Um, where are you at? 2? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, things are starting to look a little hard for number 2. And I think that's it. So now we go back to the uh, German term. <clears throat> and I think we can get number two fired, but we really need to just try to gang up on Brown. So to do that, I can get in this hex row with number two. Let's start with Von Richten first. Okay. He has to go here, one, and then... Okay, so we're going to go one, he has to turn here, two, three, four, five, oh, set our speeds, okay, six, seven, eight, nine, couldn't do it. Okay, this guy's going to go, I'm going to try to get right into this row here, so he's going to go one, two, 
that's number three. He's got nine. Whoops. Uh, three, four, five, six turns. Ah, seven, eight, nine. Didn't make it. Okay, and then this guy's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He did make it. Okay, so only one shot, and that is two. Two's gonna shoot at brown. So we roll a seven, okay, and that's actually a six. Three hexes away. Point on brown. Okay, brown is at ten. Okay, the Germans have gone. Now the anybody? Nope, nobody there. Okay, now the uh, British can go. Let's start with brown. And uh, he's got ten, so he's going to go. He's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There. This guy against uh, Rick Tofen will go. Um, whoops. Let's see. What's his airspeed? Everybody should have full airspeed here. Yeah, they do. Okay. He's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then this guy's going to do the old one. Whoops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Okay. And then the, everybody shoots here. So We'll just, let's take our, let's remember our ammunition. And here. Okay. Uh, we'll start with, let's start with brown. And brown gets a plus one. We roll a uh, eight or a nine. So at a range of one, a nine is going to do six points of damage against number three. That's going to hurt. Okay, number three takes six points of damage, putting him at one, one, two, three, four, five, one point. Okay, now we've got to figure out some speed stuff here. And uh, basically, you take one away on speed, and so that's nine minus six is three. So this is the maximum speed, and I can only climb 50 meters. Shouldn't make a difference, but that's going to get me... I'm close to shot down. Okay, that was that one. Um, number two is firing at two, so we roll a um, an, a six, and at one, a six is going to be a three points of damage to number two. Is that number two? Yeah. Okay, well, that puts him at six, or no, seven. And then Van Richthofen, the Red Baron, one, two, three, a four. And an eight, at, that's actually a seven at a range of four, is a point of damage. So attrition is just getting to him. Okay, and that ends the turn. Now we go to the German turn. Should be pretty easy for him. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's go. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. This guy will go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, 
doesn't work. If I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so what we're going to do is reduce speed to eight. Wait, no, three can't do that. Three, I just remember three only can go at three. So one, two, oh, he can't even do that. Okay, so I think what I'm going to try to do with three is get off the board. So we're going to go one, or no, I got to go, I got to go first. One, I can go there, two, three. Okay. And then number two is going to go, Okay, he can go here and turn. You know, I, I've been playing a lot of Starfleet Battles, which kind of runs the same way. It's kind of a dogfighting software, except with starships. And you can see the improvements that were being made over the years with this. Um, okay, I think everybody's gone. So number two is going to fire. Three's not going to do anything. Number two's firing. And Richtofen is firing. Okay, so Richtofen starts with a range of two, and he's an ace, so we're going to roll a six, seven at a range of two, and that is three points of damage on number three. So he's at nine. Okay, he's doing fine. Uh, number two is firing on number two, so... Number two gets an eight with a range of two. That's a four. Okay, so four points of damage, and it's also a critical hit. Let's put the damage on first. Um, is that number two? Yeah. Four. Okay, and then we roll for the critical hit, and we get a eight. Aileron cables are fouled, and so the aircraft may not turn more than one hex side per... per may not turn more than one hex side per hex. Okay, but he's also got the problem that he just took some damage. Um, let's see, he took one, two, he's three points damage below his max. So one, two, three. So he has to cut his damage back by to set or his speed. That's what I'm saying. Speed, not damage, speed back to seven. And he's two down. I think you can only go to 150 on climbs. We're not climbing a lot during this game, so. Yeah, and there's no advantage to have a, have a, being at a higher elevation in this, which is kind of weird. Okay, I think that's it for the, um, the um, Germans. Let's go ahead and Brown this time is going to try. Again, we're going to try to get Richtofen here. I'll move him back. Let's see. One, two, one, two, three, four. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Puts him right there. Yeah, we can do that. And then this guy's going to go. Number three. What's oh yeah three? I gotta remember three is three's in good shape. Okay, so he can go ten. So he's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait, six, seven. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good. Yeah, he can make it. And number two, poor number two is going to try to get off the map. I think what I'm going to do with number two is try to use a dive to get out of here. Well, no, I can do that. Okay, so number two is going to go ahead and go seven. He can move seven still. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, he's almost off the map. And then Brown and this guy are going to try to get Richtofen. Okay, so they are at... Let's start with Brown. 
and he rolls a 11. Oof. At one. Okay, so that is seven points of damage, plus it's a critical hit. So let's start with this. Oh, and I need to bring Brown down. Let's see. Number, number three. And let's go back here. Do the, everything in order. Okay. There we go. Ammunition taken care of. Now we do and inflict our damage. And we do seven points of damage. Oh, well, that, that killed him. So Richtofen was just shot out of the sky. Um, let's roll the critical hit anyway, just to see what happened. We got a 10 gas tank punctured. So that they shot down Richtofen. And don't have to roll for three. That's it for their turn. Uh, Germans get to go. Um, number three is... has a speed of three. That's all the farther he faster he can go. Now I don't they don't really address dives and speed. So actually I think you could call this minimum dive speed. Uh so three is the minimum dive speed. I can dive uh let's see I can dive up to 350 plus 250. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to do an overdive here just to show what happens. So 350 is my maximum dive plus 250 is the maximum overdive, I think. So that's um, 600. So that can give me a speed of nine for now. And I'm gonna take that. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if I roll a one or two, I end up falling apart. I get a three, so I make it. Okay, then speed goes back to three. So I'm gonna to try to escape using the overdive, which I did successfully. Okay, let's go with, number two is the last aircraft remaining for the Germans. It's still functioning. And we are gonna to try to go after Brown here. I'm gonna go one, um, that's a two, whoops. Um, oh, I'm having a hard time using my keys here. Wait a minute. One, two, three, four. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we're going to take a shot. And we roll with a minus one. I get an 11. So I got a 10. And that's six points of damage on Brown. So let's go ahead and put six points. That puts him at four. So now his speed is down to, maximum speed is down to eight. And yeah, what I was hoping I'd get a critical hit and then shoot him out of the sky, but not gonna happen. Okay. Um, the Brits get to go. So this guy gets off the map. We'll just put him off the map here. I gotta remember this guy shot down, this guy off the map. Um, I, need to, I need to really try to shoot that guy down for points. Brown's gonna go out and back. He's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, he only, I forgot he only can go so fast. Okay, Brown can only go back to uh, six. Oh, that's going to make shooting this guy down hard. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to go one, two, oh, two, can turn there, three, I can turn there, four, five, six, I did it, okay. And then this guy is gonna go one, he's gonna turn all the way around for three more. Whoops. He's gonna go, that was four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay. Oh, but his, his altitude. Um, 
The problem is he's like way over on altitude, so um, that's okay. Well, he's flying way up above him because I forgot that guy went into a dive. Okay, Brown can fire here, so he does at... Um, Brown fires at a four, and that's a five at a range of one, at two. Range of two with a five is a point damage on number two. Oh, and then take a... And let's see. Number two. There you are for a point of damage. Okay, we're still holding together. And... Then the Germans can go, and I think what we'll do is I'm going to again try to use my um, I'm going to try to dive. Number three can dive still. Uh, he's got a speed of three, and he's going to dive for 300. I didn't adjust that. Uh, that should have been... What did he dive? He dove at 600, so he should be at uh, 200. Okay, 2200. I forgot to put that dive. So now he's going to go three, another 300. And that's going to put him at 1900. And with that dive, he's going to go with an extra one, two, three. He gets a six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And... And we'll move this back to three. And that dive speed thing's a little confusing too. I don't I don't know if I get that. Okay, now number two. Number two is still pretty functional here. So we're gonna go um one. Uh let's see, that's a left. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine. Now he didn't. He didn't finish his last two, so he doesn't cite Brown. So that doesn't count. Okay, and then Brown's going to come back for another shot. I think what we'll do is we'll go one, and then two, and then flip around. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And Brown takes a shot at uh, range of one and gets a nine, and that's a ten. So at a range of one, a ten is a six points of damage. And I think that's going to be enough on, um, let's see, six points of damage on number two. Ah, okay, he's still got two left. Brown, I forgot for Brown to take off a... And he can fire back. So he fires back at a range of one, gets a three, four. That's a two at a range of one is nothing. Wait, four minus one is three. That's a three at one. One point of damage that Brown takes. Oh, I just realized he had, Brown had a thing of six. Shoot. And that does count. So let's go ahead and move him. Let's just do a re. Let's just do a repeat here. Um, number two. Are you number two? Yeah. Okay. Let's move Brown back. Shoot! I apologize, folks, for that. Okay, this guy was here, and this guy was was here. Now he can do six. So let's go ahead and try it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. That works. Okay. They roll a two, which is three. That's one point of damage. And we have a five. Okay. That sounds better. Sorry about that. Go back and correct. That was a big oversight. And then this guy, I. I don't know. He can move, I guess. I forgot that he can really move. He's really... This guy's going to get away. So, one, two, three, four, five. No, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think three's at full power. Yeah, ten. He's at ten, so... 
Okay. Maybe we can try to shoot number two down. Number two goes. Um, back to, let's check where he's at. He's at five. So now his he can move at a maximum rate of eight. Yeah, things kind of went off the rail there. But hopefully we'll be back into play. I don't know. If you guys are playing, how much do your games go off the rail? Let me know, because... Even when I'm playing, when I'm playing with another person, I have someone to remind. I have another set of eyes watching. Um, again, when I'm doing this solitaire, I don't have that set of eyes watching, and I kind of, like I say, I see one thing going on, and something else somewhere else is doing something that I'm missing. So, like right now, when I'm talking about stuff, um, this guy, he can go one, two, three, four. Um, five, five, six, seven, eight. That still doesn't put him in range. Okay, well, that's okay. Let's go with Brown, I guess. I didn't put him in sight. He's in range, he's not in sight. Okay, Brown has Brown can move at six, so he can go out here one, two, three, four. Five, six. Yeah, he can do this. So basically, he's going to end up here. He's going to go around, turn around, and come back. This other guy, uh, number three, he's in a little better shape. He still can move 10. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, he can't do that. He can go one. No, oh, he's here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And there's no, these guys don't get in each other's way. So we'll start with Brown. Brown's firing from two. Let's take our ammunition. And then number three is firing. Okay. There we go. Brown fires and gets a 7, and that's an 8. He has a range of 2. Uh, 8 is a 4 on um, number 2. 4 points. Uh, that takes him down to 1. And it's also a critical hit. So we go down to our critical hit table. We roll 2d6 and get a 12. Pilot killed. Okay, so this guy is shot down. And that ends the game. There's a lot of little details to remember. Um, I can do this solitaire better with something, again, like um, Starfleet battles where, you know, the dogfights are occurring, but uh, the impulse system just makes it easier to solitaire. On this, there's a lot of little things. Um, changes in altitude. I didn't do a lot of altitude changes in this game other than that one guy trying to get off the board. Um, and so that plays into that again complicates matters a little bit with the speed and dive speed i don't know it's not a bad game i think it's i had a lot of fun playing this when i was about 12 years old me and uh, mike dub and eric strand played this a lot so hey mike eric if you're listening you know we had a good time i sure appreciate you guys anyway that's what i've got for the week i was going to do some more of these let me know if you're interested and maybe i'll do some other scenarios for this like the balloon busting one uh i might even do the um if I had enough people that were interested, I might even do the uh, month-long campaign game, uh, which takes place over April. But anyway, that's what I got for the week. I sure appreciate you guys watching and being patient with me on these, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.